Hello? Hey. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes, and understand what I'm saying. Because I'm French, so my English can be broken sometimes. Okay, everything's fine. So if in any moment in the talk you don't understand what I'm saying, you can just shout at me. Just say, ah, repeat it, I don't understand what you're saying. Or if I'm doing something like this, you can also like just wave to me or something. Okay, shall I start? Yes. You can also like react to what I'm saying, you guys, you know? Yay! All right, let's start it then. Okay, so my talk is called Better, Faster, Stronger Scolder, which is a reference to an obscure French band that a few of you might know. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm Julian. My friends call me Gito. Uh, I'm a data engineer at Spotify. Uh, I've been working there for the last seven months or so. Um, weirdly enough, they chose to hire me for some reason. Still trying to figure out why. <laughs> uh, I've been a Scala developer for the last eight years, I think, something like that. Uh, and I've, I'm um, an open source contributor, so I worked on a few projects that had a few, or oh, committed on a few projects and created a few projects that a few of you guys may know. But uh, I'm here today to talk about what I'm doing with Spotify. So I will talk about that small company called Spotify that you guys may know. Um, who is using Spotify? Yay. Who is not using Spotify? Ooh. Why? So good. So, okay. Um, so we have roughly that number of users. Uh, those, by the way, those numbers are from June, so actually I think right now we have a bit more than that, but around 180 million users, 180 million users, um, 83 million subscribers, 40 million songs, 2 billion playlists. Um, we have data, I guess that's the point. Uh, and we are working, I am working at Spotify on a library called Shio. So who knows where Shio is? Yes, okay. Who is using Shio? Ooh, just a couple of you guys. Ooh. Using Spark instead. Oh, yeah, okay, that's good. Okay, so Shio is a Scala API that sits on top of Apache Beam. Do I have to explain what Apache Beam is? I guess so. Um, so basically Apache Beam is that processing framework that is developed by um, Google and that um, can, that you use to define your data processing pipelines and you can execute them on Dataflow, which is the Google thing, or Spark, or Flink, or a bunch of other frameworks. Um, it works for both unified, uh, for both batch and streaming pipelines, and it's open source. Um, and it's new. Uh, the Beam API is in Java, therefore we developed that shield thingy, which is in Scala, and on the right part of the slide, you can see what it looks like. So that's the word count that everyone's implementing when they're doing data processing, right? That's the first thing that you do. Um, I think it's fairly simple. Can everyone understand what he's doing? Yes, okay. <coughs> so basically you just read a file somewhere, map on that thing, count, write somewhere, close. That's very close to what you, be, you would be doing in Spark, right? It's fairly simple. Um, and that's Shio. So, Cool. It's open source. You can use it on. You can go on GitHub, um, check it out. You can also go to GitHub and ch check out all the projects that Spotify is doing because we actually have a bunch of open source projects. Uh, I guess you guys know Luigi, for example. That's Spotify. Um, there's um, other projects, so go and check it out. Um, so um, the reason why we're developing Shio at Spotify. It's not just because we want to offer a great tool to the rest of the world, uh, but because we actually want to use it, right? So we have roughly, I think, 300 users uh, that are writing Scala and data pipeline uh, using Shio in Scala at Spotify. And uh, we use it actually to write and run, I think right now, um, roughly 3,000 jobs, something like that. And uh, we have both batch and streaming jobs, obviously. And 
um, the topic of my talk today is going to be Shio 07, which is the next major version of Shio, which we're going to be releasing in the next few days. Um, so the important thing about Shio 07 is it's the first time that um, we're going to break things in the API. So I guess because only a couple of you guys are using Shio right now, that's fine. <laughs> um, but anyway, so we actually refactor the way that Shio is doing IOs, mostly to make it more generic and easier for us to maintain. Uh, we redesigned the BigQuery client, which is the big thing. Um, and uh, the subject of my talk today is going to be what we're doing with coders. Um, and that's a pretty big change in Shio. So who knows what a coder is? Yay, that guy over there. <laughs> so if you look into Beam, they explain what it is. They say, when the runners execute your pipeline, they often need to materialize the intermediate data in your P collections, which requires converting elements to and from bytes. Right. Great. Um, so it's actually fairly simple. It's just like when you write um, a data processing pipeline, you're going to run it in, on thousands of machines, hopefully. Um, so at some point, you will need to send data between the machines. Right, you need to get data from worker one to worker two. And if you want to do that, that means you have to make that bytes. It has to be bytes. Send it over the network, get bytes, make that an instance of class. Right? That's something very basic. And uh, in Shio, we're using that tool called Cryo. So who knows what Cryo is? Yeah, <laughs> most people know. Um, so yeah, so Cryo is that Java library that everyone is using um, that sort of does it automatically for you in most cases. You don't really have to do anything. Um, and uh, we've been using that for a while. And uh, when I joined Spotify, one guy came to me like literally immediately when I stepped into the office. And he said, you joined this flight map squad that's doing Shio. You need to look into the Kodos thing right now. I said, OK. I might be doing that. <laughs> and so I looked into it, and we're using Cryo, and I thought, OK, but why are we using that thing? Right? Why is everyone using Cryo? That's Spotify, at least. And well, the answer is like Spark and Flink are doing just that. So well, if it worked for them, I mean, it has to work for, you, for us, right? We're doing pretty much the same thing. Um, but more seriously, there has to be a reason, why? Right? So. Um, when I looked into that, I was thinking, oh, you know, um, what is everyone doing on the JVM, right? So I'm going to be talking about data serialization on the JVM. Woo! I should have added a pony action. Um, so yeah, so when you're fresh out of school, you think, oh, you know, it's easy. When you want to serialize something on J the JVM, all you have to do is ex extend serializable, right? And everything works, as everyone knows. Yeah. So, but before you actually do that, you can actually Google it and then look what everyone is saying about this. And if you do so, you find this. So that guy is saying, it's, it's from seven years ago, by the way. <laughs> so that guy is saying, like, well, if you do that, it works, sort of, but it's slow, and it generates a lot of garbage. That's that's cool, I guess, maybe. Um, and then he says, well, you know, you can actually like implement read external and write external. And what that does is like basically you're doing the job of the JVM. Like suddenly you're writing everything. And if you, he says, well, if you do that, you can make it like two, three times, four times faster. But actually, if you don't use it at all, that's much better. So yeah, great. Um, then if you read the uh, documentation of Beam, somewhere there's this, which I like it a lot. I found it, um, I think, last week, actually. So let's say um, ptransform actually supports, doesn't actually support serialization, but it does implement serializable, right? OK. That, that's interesting, I guess. And, and actually, they have a good reason to do that. And, and the, the reason is even better than this. 
The reason why they're actually implementing serializable is to make sure that that thing is never serialized. Yeah, that's right. That makes total sense. Um, yeah. And if you continue reading about this, you find this, which is my favorite code of ever. Like, so Oracle calls Java serialization a horrible mistake and plans to dump it. Right. So um, maybe I don't really want to use that. Well, it doesn't really stop anyone from using it, but okay. Um, so I guess the point is like serializing data to some binary state is actually really hard um, on the JVM. Yeah. And Scala makes it worse. Yeah. Sorry. Martin, let's give it. Hey. <laughs> All right, so one of the reasons why it's actually hard in Scala is because in Scala we tend to do this, which is also something you can do in Java, right? Um, but we just do it more in Scala. So you write a class, and inside a class, you say, I'm going to create an inner class, right? And that class is serializable, yay! It's going to work magically, right? Well, this isn't really serializable, but that's not what I'm serializing, so it should be fine. When you do that, what the Scala compiler is going to generate is something like this. So it's going to say, there's this class, and there's this like outer thingy that is actually a reference to the outer class. So it doesn't necessarily do that every time. Sometimes it's clever enough to figure out that you don't really need that. But um, it actually will do it many times. And what happens is, well, even though you said that thing I need to serialize, because there's a reference to the outside world, it's not serializable. So maybe you're thinking, oh, I'm never doing that in my code, so I'm fine. Well, do you use functions? Yeah, I have bad news. Uh, so that's because interesting issues. Um, if you look into Spark, they actually just uh, starting supported Scala to 12 a few months ago. And um, they created this, this issue two years ago. And it took them two years to go from Scala to 11 to Scala to 12. And for the most part, it's exactly because of that issue, right? It's because they're using that thing called the closure cleaner. And what that thing is doing is um, it's a function that is executed at runtime and tries to figure out what your closure is doing, and whether or not it needs the references to the outer classes. And if it doesn't, it just sets the values to null. So that when you try to serialize a closure, it doesn't serialize the references to the outer class. right? But because um, the way that function are implemented in Scala were changed, they had to rewrite that thing, and it took them to you. So um, if you look at to what people are doing in other languages, for example, in Rust, that's what you would see. Like in Rust, you say, I have some structure, and I don't want to say like that. Well, I'm just going to tell Rust, do it for me. And Rust is nice enough to let you do that. And actually, like the reason why it's so easy in Rust is because it's not a class, right? It's just data. So there's no function, there's no reference to the outside world that may be captured accidentally, so that's fine. Anyway, back to Scala. So serialization is really hard on the JVM, and Scala makes it worse. So yay for Cryo, right? Cryo does it for us, yay. It's magic. I don't even have to care about that. Um, so. One of the things I want to say is the reason why there's cryo in Shio is because in Shio we want two things. Um, we want serialization to not be an issue for our users. We want that to just work because when people are writing pipelines at Spotify, what we want them to think about is how to write that pipeline, what that pipeline is doing, how to implement a feature, a new feature for, for Spotify, something that creates value for users. We also want, um, want them to 
um, not care about that. And we want that to be reliable enough so that, so that they can trust us to provide something that just works, right? And not have a million issues. So prior, I guess. And so here's one of the exceptions that we see fairly often on the Scala Slack channel at Spotify. And it's an obscure one. Like people come to us and say, oh, I have this exception. Beam is saying to me, you're mut mutating things, but I'm not. So what's happening? Well, magic, right? So what's happening actually is that they're using some class that we don't support explicitly in the serialization. For example, um, a while ago we didn't support big decimal from the Scala API. And that class has a mutation inside it. So that when Cryo deserializes it, it deserializes it and then sets the value. And Beam detects that and says, no, you can't do that. And therefore you have a weird issue and a weird exception in your pipeline and you don't understand what's going on. Great. So, confusion. So the problem with Cryo is it's Java, basically. That's the issue. It's reflection-based. It's everything is happening in runtime. So if for some reason Cryo doesn't know what to do with your class, it will throw an exception. That's the only way you will know what's going to happen. And the other thing is when you use Cryo, you have to register every class is that you're going to serialize. Because if you don't do that, Cryo is going to serialize the data. And with your binary data, it's going to add the fully qualified name of the class, which is a lot of data. When you have a case class with two integers, then you have a big string with it. So when you have a pipeline that's processing terabytes of data, that's really bad. I don't want to do that. So are we doomed? I think we are, yeah. maybe. Well, actually, no. Well, a bit, but not like completely. We can actually use types, right? That's, I just realized like when I wrote my slide that I actually have the slides in, in every talk I'm doing. Like, no, I'm going to use type, yay. Great. So we can use types, yay, because we're Scala developers. Um, so what, what we did in, in Shio is like we create that thing, which is an ADT. Um, so we say, so, well, in Shio, that is in a coder, and that thing has to be serializable for reasons. Um, and there's actually two ways to implement a coder. It's either beam, so like the coder of beam, or some kind of transformation on that, and that's it. And then you say, well, every function that needs to serialize data at some point needs to have a coder passed to it implicitly. Well, that's fine. So the first line is, Shio 06, and it needs a class tag because Cryo needs runtime information about your class. And in Shio 07, with 07, we say, well, you just need a coder because you're going to serialize or deserialize that thing. Right, easy peasy. So then you implement a bunch of coders and you say, yay, and it works. And then you port your pipelines because we have 3,000 pipelines running, so we have to port code, right? And this happens. Okay. Yeah. That makes me very sad. Okay. So what do we do? Well, yay, John Brady, where's John? He's not here. Well, thank you, John. <laughs> anyway, so um, we use a library called Magnolia. And Magnolia, what it's going to do is it's going to derive coders when we're using product types in Scala for us automatically at compile time. So we don't have to do it. Yes, because I don't want to do it. It's really boring. So it does automatic color derivation. It's fairly efficient in the code it generates. And it doesn't blow up the compiler, which is also good. Um, demo, right. Sorry about that. All 
All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. So let's say I create a case class. Oh, first of all, this. So what I just did here is I asked the Scala compiler, can you get me a color of integer? And it says, yes, there's such a thing in Beam. And I can say, can you get me a color of list of integers? Yes, it can do that. And it's a transformation based on the integer color. Yeah, right. So if I create a cast class and I say, can I get a color for that thing? Yes, because Magnolia, yay. Oh, you can't see it, sorry. Better? Right, so Magnolia did it for us, yay. Easy. Next, that was my demo. Thank you. I mean, the fact that it's not impressive should be a feature, it just works. <laughs> All right, but what about Java classes? Because Magnolia doesn't support Java classes, right? Well, no. So what we say is, well, if you can't find a color for that thing, you just fake it. Just pretend to have it. Because um, we don't really want our users to have to figure out that they need to create an implicit for everything. We sort of want it to work all the time anyway. So Magnolia gives you fallbacks. Yes, that's great. So essentially what we're going to say is, if you can derive a proper nice coder at compile time, you do that. But if you cannot, then you just, just use cryo. That's what you were doing before, that's fine. And what happened is like, 90% of the cases, Magnolia can derive something. And it's like 10% that cannot. We're just going to use cryo, but we're going to warn the user at compile time. We're going to say, well, here I use cryo, so maybe be careful about it, right? Demo again. Right. So let's say I use a silly class from the Java API, like that thing. Can you get me a code for that? No, I cannot. And here's, it's compile time, okay? So, got that thing? Yes. So what the compiler is telling us is, I cannot find an implicit for that thing. So, sorry, I'm going to use cryo. But it also tells us, if you want to implement it because you're a nice and careful data engineer, here's what you need to do, right? That's helpful. So what if you say, can you get me a list, a colorful list? E, of local. Still say you only need to implement the colorful local. It doesn't, it doesn't say you need a colorful list of local. It knows that it knows how to serialize list, and it tells you you just need to provide me something that serializes locals. What if you say, I have a guest class, foo2, that's it's not using a string, but a local. Can you give me a code for that thing? Yes, and still, it only it's only complaining about the local issue. It's not complaining about the integer. It's not about complaining, it's not complaining about foo. Only local is an issue, right? <laughs> That's not how implicit work. Anyway, that was my second demo. Okay, so is it fast? So I wrote a little benchmark, and it was, it's not very scientific though. But anyway, it's a class that I found in some project of Spotify that says we have a user, the user have an ID, an ID is actually a class too that has an array of bytes. Um, and the user have a name and an email. And I tried to serialize that. Or, yeah. So, Java is Java serialization. Cryo registers like what you do generally when you're using Cryo, which is you just say to Cryo, I need to serialize user, just figure out something. 
and cryo with a custom color is when you implement everything yourself using cryo. Beam is implementing your, everything yourself using the Beam API. That takes a lot of code. And then there's Magnolia, which is what um, Shio is going to be do for you. So first thing first, Java, yay. It's freaking slow. <laughs> yeah, really, really slow. And also, it's pretty big. 244 bytes for that thing. Two strings, yay. OK, Cryo does a much, much better job. Uh, five times faster than Java for uncoding things. Um, I think that's like a lot times faster when it comes to decoding. It's like 30 times faster. And in terms of size, it's um, seven times um, smaller, I think. That's cool. Um, if you go the painful way and you write everything yourself, you get something that's slightly faster to encode, significantly faster when it comes to decoding, it takes a bit less space for some reason that I don't know why. If you use Beam, it's even faster in encoding. And then, why is it slower? It's weird. Anyway, we'll see that later. Uh, the size is even smaller. And when you use Magnolia, where you don't write anything, everything just works, well, it's actually pretty fast. It's faster than Cryo. That's good. And also, it takes less space, which is also good. So the thing that happens with Beam is that there's a bug in Beam. Oh, that's too bad. But I fixed it. Yay. I didn't want to do that, but I had to. Anyway, so when you fix it, suddenly you're even faster than Cryo. And Magnolia is also faster than Cryo. It's a bit slow when it comes to decoding, um, but I actually know why, and I need to talk to John about that. Um, but anyway, um, that is pretty cool, right? We are actually pretty fast. We don't have to write any code, and everything happened at compile time. So I was really happy. So next, what about porting a real production pipeline and trying to run things? So by the way, that pipeline was actually written by the guy who came to me first day at Spotify to tell me everything is slow with, with Shio, you have to do something. Um, and that guy is Russian and careful about performances. So I'm pretty sure that his pipeline was actually fairly optimized. And what happened is like he had this pipeline. It's not the biggest pipeline in Spotify, but it's still big-ish. Uh, it was running in roughly an hour using 200 workers. And someone in his team just ported that to Shio 07, Alpha 1. And suddenly, the execution time was done 45 minutes. And uh, it's only used 190, um, yeah, 190 um, workers. So that's roughly, I guess, 25% faster, something like that. That's not bad. OK. Yay. Are you not impressed? Come on. <laughs> OK. Next, that's like the bonus thing. So we broke a bunch of things in Shio 07. So even though you didn't really have to care about colors too much, the other thing we broke were actually pretty bad. Um, so I ported one of the biggish pipelines at Spotify, uh, Spotify just to try it out. I didn't know anything about that pipeline. So that, I think 30 is thousand lines of Scala, something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it was, it was a pipeline that actually gives insights about how people are using Spotify to artists. So that's a really important one for, for, for Spotify. And uh, so I ported that thing, and I had just upgraded Shio, see what happens, and 600 compilation errors. Well, I don't really want to fix 600 compilation errors manually, because that would take day, days. Um, so because I didn't want to do it, uh, I thought I could probably do it with code, right? <laughs> because I'm lazy. So 
um, the Scala Center is now providing that tool called, called ScalaFix that you can use to go through the ADT of your program and create patches automatically. So I tried, I implemented a few patches, um, and I ran that on the pipeline that had 600 compilation errors, and then I got six errors, which is much better. I had to fix three of them, and then I was done. Everything was running fine, and all the tests were green, so great. Thank you, Scalafix. And I think this is going to be everything I have for now. So that's the shield for GitHub, uh, for the GitHub for shield. Um, that's the GitHub for shield. That's my Twitter. You can follow me. And that's uh, Spotify jobs, right? So I, I guess you get the message. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's what I have. Thank you, guys. Any questions? Do you have a microphone? Oh, by the way, if, you, if you're not comfortable speaking in English, you can ask questions in French, and I'll translate. OK, so uh, a year ago, I tried to use Sayo in production. Only I wasn't on Google Cloud. I was on AWS. So what I did is uh, <laughs> I patched uh, the library several times to make it work on Flink with the Flink runner. Uh, but I had production, uh, production problems and memory problems because the cryo serializer on Flink is optimized uh, with me uh, specific memory, ma memory segment management, etc. So. What would you advise? Would you advise running SAO on anything else than that for right now? Yes. So um, yeah. So that's something I've tried actually, like running pipelines on, on, on Flink. Um, I guess you have to complain to Google because they're providing the runners. Um, at Spotify, we're only using Dataflow, so it's not really an issue for us. Um, I think Google is is or will be working this year on in improving the runners. So hopefully it's going to work in a few months. I certainly hope so. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Any other question? No? Come on, don't be shy. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>